webinar organized by the elder and we also thank jason sir for uh, accepting our invitation to take a session for us on qualitative and the quantitative data analysis so this uh, website or the, this webinar is organized under the hanbi project that the elda is running since last three months so most of the teachers they have already finished their exploration stage now they are about to start analyzing their data so based on their needs and we plan this webinar for the jason sir and the jason sir is a, a researcher publisher and the textbook writer and he is also doing his phd in the warwick university and uk so last year he did a project with us and effective teachers in india so with that uh, connections and that intimacy and we invited him and thank you jason sir for accepting our invitation and joining us please uh, go ahead tivira sir do you want to talk anything anything Thank you very much, Vinay, for that uh, introduction. That's great. So yes, as Vinay said, I had a very interesting time um, working in India with eight amazing teachers in uh, 2019, 2020, just before the terrible coronavirus outbreak, the first outbreak. Um, and I learned a huge amount, both working with Vinay in his school, um, and working also with Raju Lingala, who I know is a member of the um, El Tatane Telangana group. And I have met several of the members here as well in different conferences. So it's really nice to see your faces and to see so many participants. As Vinay said, today we're going to focus on this issue of data analysis. So let me begin, first of all, by sharing my slides. Uh, oh, one second, let me. One second. Right, one second, we're nearly there. Okay, can you see my slides okay? Yes. Excellent, great. Great, great, great. So, oops, where have my slides gone? Oops, sorry, I'm just formatting my screen. Just give me a second. Having a little bit of an issue here. Oops, gone again. Okay, I'll just put it over here. Having a slight problem with the formatting of the screen. That'll do. Okay, that'll do. Right. So, um, yes, as Vinay said, um, this talk is, um, well, we've called it qualitative and quantitative data analysis for teacher research. Um, I suppose the focus of the talk is in understanding the difference between what we sometimes call teacher research, classroom-based research, and the thing that it's often contrasted and even confused with, which is academic research. And today I want to explain a little bit about how they're different, why they're different, what the aims of teacher research should be, and how if you want to make your research a little bit more academic, a little bit uh, more appropriate for those kind of contexts, how you can do so. Um, so, um, we'll explore initially the differences between these two types of research, um, and then we're going to use an example. I think it's really useful to work with examples when you talk about any type of research. Um, and we're going to look at an example with a teacher called Rumana and her exploratory action research project, EAR, just stands for Exploratory Action Research. If you've never heard of it before, it's a specific type of action research that was developed by Richard Smith, who is my supervisor at Warwick, um, but also is used quite a lot in India on a range of projects. I know the participants in, for example, Vinay's current project are, are usually doing exploratory action research, and I think probably many of you have heard of it. 
Um, but if you haven't, don't worry. We will see in a moment what it is and how it works. Um, then we're going to ask some, some interesting questions. Why analyze data? And what am I looking for when I analyze data? Um, we'll also look at why puzzles are good. Often when we're conducting research, we come across puzzles by which I mean difficult questions or problems or things that we don't understand yet. Um, and then we'll look a little bit about taking your research further, for example, publication or uh, presenting at a conference. Um, there'll be some examples and publications that I'll share. And I want to devote plenty of time, at least 15 minutes if possible, possibly more for um, questions, comments and opinions. Now, just to say, I've got the chat running here on my screen. So if you have a question, or if something is not clear to you, um, remember that that's my responsibility to make sure it's clear. So please feel free to include your question, include any comments, any thoughts you have, possibly even a correction if I make a slight mistake. All of that is useful and all of that is good. And I'm very much looking forward to your questions at the end. So even if you don't put a question in now, you could write it down somewhere else and then you can ask it at the end. Um, if anybody feels that they would prefer to use their audio to ask a question, um, as long as you're sure it's relevant and you think it will be useful for others, please feel free to do so and just interrupt and say, can I ask a question? Because for me, this should be a, a dialogue rather than simply, well, it will be mainly a one-way process, but I hope there will be some dialogue as well. Okay, any questions at this stage? 38 participants, that's great. I don't know how many we've got on Facebook, but that's good. Okay, so let's have a look at this important difference between what we will call teacher research, also called classroom-based research, and academic research. So teacher research, I'm a teacher as well, just like I presume many of you. So I'm going to use the word me to talk about the teacher. Um, Teacher research is based on something that is important to my work in my classroom. So in other words, for me to do teacher research, it must be relevant to my world and it should be relevant to my world. It should be useful to me. There is a key word that we need to think about all the time, understanding. Teacher research increases my understanding of an aspect of my teaching. Obviously we can't research everything um, and the, the aim of teacher research is usually to focus on one specific area or question, what we call the research question, um, so that I can understand that. And then that will often link to other important areas I want to study. Um, it is always relevant and useful to my context. And what I mean by that is you can imagine that teacher research done in my classroom here in the UK may be useful to me, but may not be useful to teachers working in Telangana because the way that we teach English, the students, the classroom size, the resources we have available are obviously different. Um, and so this question of context is very important. Teacher research, because I'm doing it in my own classroom, it's useful to me. Um, now, importantly with teacher research, if you don't want to, you don't have to share your findings with anyone. Obviously, if you've got a mentor who is helping you to conduct research, then that mentor will, will want to look at your findings to be able to help you. But it's important to note that it's very much for you and your classroom and potentially your colleagues in your school or cluster. But if you do want to share it with colleagues, there are lots of ways this can be done, and we will look at those later. And importantly, teacher research doesn't have to include a detailed report. Um, you could present findings to colleagues, or you could simply keep the findings for yourself. Perhaps the most important people to present your findings to is your students. And by presenting the findings, you often indicate to the students that you care about your work, you care about them, and you're interested in the research. They will also be interested, so you can present the findings. If Depending on their level of English, you can present them in English, you could present them in Telugu, or whatever the um, most enabled language of your classroom is, other than English. 
English, the other language of the school, if there is one, um, or you could present in a combination. So you can present a little in English and then explain in Telugu as well. So teach research is research by teachers for teachers. And I might even add in brackets and students. And they are the main focus of teacher research. Academic research comes in many different forms. The research that is conducted, if we might call it kind of for publication, is a very specific type of research. But the majority of us, when we come across academic research, it is usually for qualifications when we're doing our MAs or PhDs like me. Um, and for presentations is the other kind of context where we do it for. There's often a supervisor rather than a mentor, so the relationship is more formal. Um, the aim of the supervisor isn't simply to help you, but to make sure that you meet the requirements of the qualification usually. Um, it may be useful for the classroom, but not necessarily. Um, for example, one thing that I, a piece of research that I conducted that was more formal was on the ways that Indian teachers use different languages in their classrooms. That wasn't really relevant for my own classroom, but it was very interesting for me because as a teacher educator, I'm interested in learning from how Indian teachers use multiple languages in very interesting ways. Um, Teacher research often requires time consuming and complex analysis, sorry, ac academic research, time consuming and complex analysis of data. Um, this can take hours, days, weeks. Um, to give an example for my PhD research, there are eight participants and it took me about three or four weeks to analyze the data for each participant working full time. And I'm lucky in that I have the time to do that, but obviously many of us don't. And this is a very important difference. We need to make sure that teacher research doesn't take up too much of our time. If it does, it becomes destructive, not constructive, because it takes time away from lesson planning, from helping students, potentially from providing feedback to students on their work, the correction that we provide, and so on. And obviously, it requires detailed report writing, um, whether that be a dissertation, a thesis, or an academic paper, that all takes a long time as well. And the input, I've kind of made the same point twice, actually, about it being relevant, same as useful. Okay, any questions? Am I easy to understand? Feel free to write in the chat. Okay, thank you, Sneha. Thank you, Sangeeta. Arcana, great. Okay, cool. So let's have a look at what we sometimes call exploratory action research. Um, now, I'm going to show some lit links to publications with exploratory action research in them at the end of this workshop. But if you look in the chat, higher up in the chat, if you scroll up, you will find I've linked to the slides so you can also see those publications. They're all free and they're all easy to understand. Now, action research typically involves a cycle with four basic stages, and there are many variations. Some of them include extra stages. Those are the stages that we can see on the slide in blue. Crystal clear, thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the, the stages that we can see in blue, the four stages, are the typical stages of action research, and sometimes there are different words used for this. So the stage, the first stage that we would normally engage in is plan then act, then observe, and then reflect. And we call it a cycle often because after reflection, there is often another arrow linking to plan. So that after reflecting, we then plan the next stage. I haven't included it here because I wanted to include just one cycle of research. So that's the typical action research cycle. And the key thing about action research is that it requires action. It requires us to make a change in our classroom. Exploratory action research doesn't start there. Exploratory action research starts with exploration of the classroom. Our aim is before we change anything, before we make any intervention, as they're sometimes called, we should first try to understand what is happening in the classroom, the situation. And very often it starts with research into the learners and into things like their needs, their challenges, uh, their preferences, and some feedback on our teaching. 
So an exploratory action research cycle would typically begin with um, planning to decide what aspect of our classroom we're going to explore to understand a bit more. Then based on that exploration, we will analyze some data. It could be interviews with students, questionnaires, maybe getting a colleague to observe our lesson or even using a um, camera to observe the lesson, for example, on a mobile phone obviously with the permission of the students and our head teacher, uh, school director. Then we would normally analyze that data and that will provide the necessary basis for making the change. If we don't do any exploration first, there is always a danger that we could change something that in fact isn't a problem or isn't a good idea to change. So that initial stage is very important for making the action research uh, successful in our classroom. So there we go, that's the approximate exploratory action research cycle. And you can sometimes see it, I'll show a publication later where it's shown in steps rather than in a typical cycle. So let's take an example teacher and let's imagine her action research project. Again, EAR stands for Exploratory Action Research. And uh, let's call our teacher Rumana. And this is based on a piece of research, not that Rumana did, but which somebody else did, I know, and obviously I wouldn't use their name. Um, now let's imagine that Rumana reads an article in a magazine, maybe, um, that English teachers, when they're correcting the writing of students' work, you know how we sometimes correct our students' writing, we collect it in, provide correction, and then give it back to them, that we should not only correct mistakes, but should also write positive comments, what is sometimes called positive feedback or simply praise. And I'm sure we all praise students in the classroom when we go, yes, good, well done, shabash, good work. Um, but also in the writing. And this is what the article was saying. So Romana is interested to investigate and she creates a question that she wants to answer. And this is what we can call the research question. Her question is very simple and very specific. How important is positive feedback when correcting student work? Okay. Um, and like most questions that we formulate for action research, it's good to have quite a specific focus to the question. And that makes it easier to direct our research and direct our attention at whatever it is we need to research. So let's now have a look at how that fits into an exploratory action research project. So to begin with, Rumana thinks, well, it's going to be a good idea to interview the students because they are the people who will probably tell me, be able to tell me how useful it is to correct, um, to provide, whether to provide positive feedback as well as correction. So she starts with the explore phase. And then, and in the phase, she interviews the students and I'll provide an example of exactly how she does that in a moment. She then analyzed the interview results and then she plans to try out a new approach based on the feedback from the students. And I'll give you the example in a moment. Then she acts, she tries out the new approach, and then she observes. In other words, she does something to understand the impact of her action. And in Rumana's case, she conducts a survey to assess the impact of her um, plan of her action. So the, the survey, by the survey, I mean a questionnaire, for example, asking the students. And after this, she reflects on the findings of her survey, and she decides whether she wants to explore the classroom a bit more or to plan. Yeah, so data, Vinay has asked a really interesting question there. Why is the data we collect during action research simple when compared to academic research? I'll come on to that in a moment, Vinay. That's very much one of the things I want to provide an example with of. So going back into detail, so I'm going to now look at each of these stages of Rumana's project. First of all, looking at how she will interview the students and how she will analyze that data. Then we will look at specifically what change she makes in her classroom and how she will conduct the survey. And in the process, I'll also include how she analyzes the data and importantly, how she keeps it simple. Um, because the key 
point, I suppose, when it comes to the question of why it should be simpler is because teachers are very, very busy people. And whilst academic researchers have time and the opportunity to spend hours, sometimes days, conducting analysis, we need to do it quickly because if we take too much time away from our normal work, it can have a negative effect on the classroom. Yes, and the same question that Vinay is asking, I will come back to that Vinay, about the major difference between analysing academic research and exploratory action research data. Um, but I won't focus too much on the academic research um, uh, processes themselves. We'll use Romana's um, project as an example. So let's imagine that Romana wants to study this question about um, whether it's useful to give positive feedback when you're correcting students' written work, as well as providing correction of their mistakes. So she conducts interviews with her students. Now, interviews would typically fall under qualitative uh, data, unless you have a very, very structured interview with very close questions, and those don't tend to be very useful. If your questions are that close, you would normally use a survey or a questionnaire. Um, and she decides she has three classes. Imagine that she teaches three classes and let's say she's a secondary teacher teaching, say, grades seven, eight and nine. And she interviews three focus groups, one from each of her classes. Interviewing all her students would take too much time and it probably isn't necessary because at this stage she just wants to get a general understanding for students' opinions on the question that she is focusing on. So she interviews one group of three students from the grade nine class, one group from the grade eight class, and one group from the grade seven class. And she interviews them in Telugu, which is their mother tongue in our example, um, because that means the students can express themselves fully and can focus on what they want to say rather than having difficulty saying it. And if they want to, I'm sure they can speak English, but typically this would be done, this kind of interview will be done in the student's um, preferred first language. And in each of the groups, she includes strong, average and weaker students. And personally, I don't like these terms. I would prefer to say more English proficient students and less English proficient students, because as we all know, um, all students are strong at different things. And so calling them strong or weak is perhaps not the right term. But to keep it simple, I will use those terms. Uh, yes, and Azad has made an interesting point. Yeah, Azad, it's true that qualitative data analysis does involve a, a high degree of subjectivity and quantitative more objectivity, but there's both sides to both um, when we're analysing data. And the blended mode that Azad is talking about is sometimes called mixed methods, and Romana's project involves both qualitative and quantitative. In other words, it's a mixed method project. So, in Romana's interview, she decides to ask open questions. And by open questions, as teachers, I think we all know what I mean. Questions like why, how, which, when, where, who. Questions that start with question words rather than closed questions which limit the students' um, answers. So instead of asking the students, um, do you like error correction or do you find error correction useful she can say to the students tell me about error correction when i correct your work what are your thoughts ah what do you think about that why is that useful why isn't it useful and so on keeping it as open as possible um, and the students talked quite a lot, so she was happy. And of course, she recorded it, as we typically do when we're conducting research. Where's my recorder? <laughs> I've got a data recorder right here. I'm not using it now, obviously, but she recorded it. And you can record it on one of these or on your phone. And, and that enables her then to listen to it again, which is very important. But the first important thing to notice is that even without any formal analysis, Rumana will come away from that interview with a better understanding of the needs of her learners. So if you're watching this um, webinar and you're very busy, like most teachers in Telangana are, and you think I haven't got time to do action research because of this, remember that all of us have probably got a little bit of time every now and then to interview our students about a specific aspect of the lesson of the teaching. And because we do it outside of normal classroom time, and we often do it in smaller groups, we can often get really useful feedback on our teaching that can help us to improve in the future. 
But of course, Romana is involved in an action research project, so she does want to do some further analysis. Now, before she does this analysis, she thinks, well, the students um, said that correction was useful and praise was also useful. Well, important is what I've put here. Um, and so she, her, her initial kind of understanding is the students think that both of them are important. And this is kind of what she would have guessed before she even started the project. So the initial interview has told her something useful. It's confirmed her suspicion about the students' opinions. But she can also do a little bit more analysis to check whether her first impressions are correct. Oh, Nune, that's an interesting question. I'll come back to that. We can maybe discuss it later. Um, so the, the very simple thing she does, if you've recorded interviews with students, teachers, anybody, parents, obviously that data, you must keep it um, confidential because that is research data. Keep it to yourself and only play it to somebody else who signs or agrees to be confidential about the data. It's important that we have the confidence of people that we interview when we're doing uh, research. Um, so she listens to the interviews again one evening and she does so with a colleague from a different school um, let's imagine that her colleague is also engaged in the same action research project and maybe they do it face to face or if they can't meet up face to face they can listen to it online on zoom for example and together they listen to the interviews again and that provides her with some useful information she starts to notice some different things that it's not simply that only correction and positive feedback were important, but the students talked about what type of correction was useful, what type of positive feedback was useful. But her colleagues notices something that maybe she didn't notice first time, that the interviews were each dominated by one student and that some students said very little. But she noticed that one girl said something strange and this girl said, I try not to make mistakes so I don't get the red pen. And at the time, um, Rumana didn't ask this girl what she meant, but she thinks this is important. And her, her colleague thinks this is important. So Rumana, the next week, decides to ask this girl another question. And here is a very important feature of teacher research that's different to academic research. In academic research, it would be a bit strange to do this. But in teacher research, we can do it because we're often close to the people or the things we're researching. So she adds on a little bit more data by going back to this student and maybe after a lesson, confidentially, when nobody else is listening, she asks this girl, what did you mean when you said, I try not to make mistakes so I don't get the red pen? And the girl explained to her that her father, who he didn't have the opportunity to go to school, let us imagine he's a farmer, um, and he couldn't read, but he remembered from his own time at school that the red pen was a negative thing. And therefore, whenever he saw a red pen on his children's work, he punished them. Um, and this is why the little girl was very concerned about getting red pen on her notebook on her copy book because she was worried that her father would punish her and he thought that it was bad. So you can see that Rumana has conducted a very simple bit of analysis of her interview data. It doesn't involve anything technical or anything that isn't common sense to us. The first part of analysis happened during the interview. As she asked them the questions, straight away she could understand what they were saying. They were speaking the mother tongue, also Romana's mother tongue, and she could ask further questions. But also afterwards, by listening again, she could get a better understanding. And sometimes you can listen two or three times to your data, or you can listen with a colleague. As long as they have um, agreed to be confidential about your data, you can listen with them as well. And they will often see something or hear something that you don't see. And she's now starting to understand that, in fact, there seems to be a difference in terms of what type of positive and what type of correction students need what type of praise and what type of correction they need. Now I'm going to progress with this. I just want to have a quick look at some of your comments, which are really interesting. 
Um, so Nune, yes, Nune's mentioned this point, is mother tongue an obstacle for non-English medium students to improve their fluency? No, mother tongue, in my opinion, Nune, is always something that helps us to learn. Mother tongue is the most important learning resource that all students have. Um, quite naturally, if we're talking about in much of Telangana, um, if Telugu is the mother tongue of the students, we can and should use that to help them to learn English. So we can scaffold their learning from Telugu to English. So one thing that Vinay, Radha Vinayata does, and also Raju does, my other colleague from Telangana, um, is that when students couldn't say something in English, they ask them to say it in the mother tongue and then they helped them to say it in English, or they got another student to help them to say it in English. So I would never personally say that it's an obstacle. I would say the mother tongue helps the learners to think, and it's the basis on which they learn all new languages. Okay. Venkateshwar has asked how to analyze qualitative data. Are there any parameters for qualitative data? I'm not sure what we mean by parameters here, but to give you a simple example, um, Venkateshwar. Rumana's analysis here is a very simple example of how we could analyze qualitative data in order to understand more about our learners. Remember that teacher action research is about understanding. And if she has achieved that at this stage, she's done a good thing. In her exploratory research, if I just go back, um, in her exploratory research, she's conducted this first stage of the project. And that's a useful thing. Um, right, let's have a look, whatever questions we've got. Vijay Kumar, thank you. Action research does focus on educative obstacles students. Um, action research focuses definitely on, among other things, the obstacles that students face in their learning. Yes, if we could prioritize things, it's things that, are, that, that we personally feel are most important for improving learning and that can be absolutely anything from the students the materials the school environment uh, even whether the fan is working that can be an important thing uh, when conducting action research and azad has made a comment i think making categories which are similar in nature of the responses is one of the parameters to analyze the data absolutely azad so um, what azad is talking about here is when we categorize data during the process of coding so we can listen back to an interview and we can make a note on the different um, things that are said. We can even transcribe the data, which means that we write down everything that is said and then we use that to categorize it. The only problem with that, Azad, is it takes a long, long time. And sometimes if we listen and make notes, that can be a much simpler way to conduct an initial, initial analysis of data. Remember that analysis doesn't mean anything differently in teacher research than it does in normal research. To analyze something, you can look at it in detail, look at it carefully, but you don't necessarily need to carry out transcription and categorizing. Exactly, and Nune has made a really important point that even positive feedback can be given with a red pen. Nune, I agree 100%, but what was interesting was in this story, the girl's father had himself received only negative feedback with a red pen. And because he couldn't read English, he thought that wherever he saw red pen in his daughter's notebook, um, it was a criticism. So if there was lots of red pen, he punished her. So here's a question for you, and I want you to think and respond in the chat with your ideas. Based on her analysis, so this is the exploratory phase, what do you think Rumana decided to do in her classroom when she marked her students' writing? Do you think based on this that she chose to give only correction? Do you think she chose only to give positive comments? Or what? What do you think she did based on her initial data from her exploratory phase? I'll have a drink of water while I'm waiting for your comments. We've already got a comment from Dr. Madhavi. Thank you, Dr. Madhavi, has suggested stars and a rubric. So stars, obviously, where you put a star next to the student's work, or even you can sometimes stick them onto the work. I've got some in my drawer down here, actually. 
Uh, oh, I can't find them, but <laughs> but yes, you can stick stars onto the students' work as well. Um, and we've got the suggestion of uh, providing a rubric, which is really interesting and really useful at higher levels of learner proficiency. Rubric is definitely a good idea. But importantly, if the students don't understand that rubric, it may not actually help them so much. So the rubric itself could become an obstacle until students get to a level of uh, literacy that enables them to use it. Um, Vijay Kumar, I'll leave that question for a moment because Padma has produced a really useful um, suggestion, smiling faces, emojis, yes, and Vishnu has provided one as well, contextual praise. So there we go. What One of the things she decided to do was based on this initial bit of feedback, she decided instead of using the red pen, I'll just use my blue pen. I'll just use my blue pen to correct them. And that's one way I can stop at least one learner getting unnecessary negative <laughs> negative feedback from her uh, father. But she also decided to do exactly what um, um, Dr. Madhavi and Padma suggested, which is to use smiley faces and hearts to indicate um, that the students were doing well, because that also communicates with anybody. And Vishnu makes a really useful comment that she could also try. And that is because now she knows that the students um, seem to like praise, that she could provide contextual praise by providing it, for example, when uh, she gives back the work to the students. So great, there we go. So that's the first phase of her analysis. So what does she do then? She then decides to try out her new approach in which she provides students, when she marks their work, she provides correction. She thinks that's important. The students think it's important. She provides praise. So she puts some comments like, well done, and some smileys and some hearts, and let's add stars to that as well, so that the students get a nice balance of the two. And she avoids using the red pen because she now knows that that could be a problem for at least one student. And she tries that approach for two weeks. So in each class, maybe two or three pieces of writing they, they do. She provides feedback to them using this combination of both correction and positive feedback. And then after two weeks, she gives a survey to her students. Now, Rumana, like many teachers, has very large classes. She's got about 40 or 50 students in each class. So instead of giving the survey, the questionnaire to every student, which costs a lot of money for the photocopying, um, and it's more data for her to analyze, she she chooses a sample of the students. And what I mean by a sample is simply when you choose a smaller number of students who are representative of the whole class. So in each class, she, she gives it out to 10 learners and she gives it to a few of the stronger students who are more proficient in English, a few of the average students at English, and a few of the students who are, having, who are struggling more with English, the weaker students, if we call them that so that she gets 30 questionnaires completed from each class, okay? And it's a good idea to do this not in general lesson time, that's important for the learners learning, but to get them to maybe to do it at a different time, for example, in the lunch break, or if appropriate and agreed with the parents after school. And again, she gives it to them in Telugu. Why? To ensure that they understand, because her aim is to understand the students' needs, to understand the students' feedback, and to give them the opportunity to say as much as they can. A questionnaire, a quantitative survey, will typically count the data. So that's why it's called quantitative, because it's about quantities. Um, but it could also include aspects of qualitative data. For example, you can include open questions on your survey, such as, why did you choose your response to question two, three or four. Okay. Um, and in her survey, she asks simple questions to investigate her research questions directly. And let's have a look at a few of her results. There was quite a lot of them, but here are some of her results. So one of her questions, she asked the students, is correction useful to you? And all 30 of them said, yes, it's useful. So 30 was the response rate. Uh, praise is praise useful? Yes, they all said praise. So she got 30 responses, all positive, indicating that they all found praise useful. Which did they prefer, correction or praise? Well, 18 of the students said they preferred correction, and 18 said they preferred praise. And then she also asked them about the pen because she knew this was important. And sure enough, the majority of the students told her that they preferred the blue pen. 26 students said that as opposed to four who said the red pen. 
And she even asked them, which is your favorite praise emoji? And she was only using the smiley and the hearts and 14 said smileys and 16 said hearts. And she noticed something interesting, something important. One second, I'm just gonna take, drink some water. She noticed that most girls preferred the hearts and most boys preferred the smileys because in her survey, she also collected data on the gender of the students who were responding. And so she found that it was mainly the boys who preferred the smileys, mainly the girls who preferred the hearts. So here's another question for you. She's conducted her action phase. She's found out that there is a combination of praise and correction preferred by the students. What do you think she decided to do in her future teaching? Please share your thoughts in the chat now. I'll wait a few minutes for anybody to provide any suggestions. Do you think, for example, that her research stopped there? And, or do you think she continued to do exactly what she'd been doing during that phase? Thank you, Padma. Use a combination of both. Thank you, Vishnu, to create a positive attitude. Absolutely, Dr. Madhavi. She's now going to avoid using the red pen. And for some students, for some teachers, that isn't a problem. But for this teacher, for her students, it was. And both, thank you, yes. Exactly, yeah, Syed, yes, and Sneha. Yeah, so she's gonna do that. Probably she notices that the girls like the hearts and the boys like the smileys, so she can choose to do that. And she can even experiment with other emojis and other stars as, um, as uh, Dr. Madhavi suggested earlier. And exactly, yes, Vinay, she considered her students' voices. So there we go. You've kind of got the key things right, but Rumana, let me tell you something else. Um, which helps her to become a better teacher is, is a key question, Vinay. That's the question that we all need the answer to. And the answer is probably going to be different for every teacher around the world. One thing that she didn't understand was how was it that they all found correction useful and praise useful? And yet when she asked which they prefer, there was actually a difference in balance. 18 said correction, 12 cent praise. So she was a bit unsure about this and it caused her to think more and more. Hmm, do I really understand what's happening here? Do I really understand enough about the student's response to my action? Going back to the action research cycle, remember that she's done the exploration and she's done the action. And after the action, she still doesn't understand much more than she did at the end of the exploration. Um, and then thank you, Madhavi, yes, gender neutral symbols. I suppose you could use gender neutral ones. It was just an interesting fact that she found that the boys seem to prefer the, the, um, the um, emojis and the girls seem to prefer the hearts as well. And exactly, Vinay, she's introspecting, she's checking, she's thinking about what she's, she's doing. Um, yes, good, good, good. Interesting stuff. Thank you, Sayed Shamsandar as well. Um, but she's confused. She's got uh, something that she doesn't understand. This is her puzzle. So what does she decide to do? She decides, instead of simply moving on and finishing her project, she decides to do more interviews. But this time, because the last time she interviewed, she noticed that some students said a lot and some students were silent. She decides this time to interview the stronger students separately from the weaker students. So imagine she gets uh, two groups of stronger students from two of the classes and two groups of weaker students from two of the classes. And she interviews them separately. And here is what she found out. She actually found out that the stronger students wanted more correction. Not surprising. You guys, I think you probably all know these students. One of the students said, and this was all in Telugu, he said, praise is nice, but I want to know my mistakes. Otherwise, how will I improve? So this student was very ambitious. 
And a girl said, if you give me correction, my private tutor can help me. She can explain the mistake to me. This girl has an extra tutor, as many students do in India. But the weaker students helped her during these interviews to understand why her praise was important. One of the students said, if you give me a tick or a smiley for a sentence, I know it's a good one. So I remember to use it again in the future. So now she understands why the positive feedback is giving an impact, because it tells the students what work they can, what expressions, sentences they can use again um, in the future. And another student said this, and this made her stop and think. This was a really important piece of data for her. A little girl said, praise makes me feel happy. And I show it to my parents who are happy. And because her father was happy, he bought her a new copy book. And the next day I was so proud of it. I showed it to my friends and started to try harder in English. And that particular student started to improve soon after that. So it was an interesting example that she found out from doing these initial interviews that there was a, a significant difference between what the strongest students in her class wanted and what the weaker students wanted. And by analysing the data, but also going back and doing more interviews, again, something that wouldn't normally be done in academic research, she actually learnt more about the students' needs. And again, she learned about it pretty much directly from simply listening to the interviews. She didn't need to conduct any kind of coding, any kind of categorization, because she was understanding what the difference in these opinions was. Uh, we've got some interesting points here about colours as well. It's an interesting point about colours. I'm just looking at your chat, if I may. Um, that for some students, it is an important thing. And in, in the UK, we often use green pens for correction of notebooks. But then again, green suddenly sometimes becomes the colour for correction. So it replaces red. Um, and you can also use pencil, as Ashapurana says, as well, because with pencil, you can mark, you can rub out your own work if you don't want to, or the students can even do so. Um, children don't like negative feedback, but I think many children also like some correction because it does help them to improve as long as we provide it carefully and sensitively. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting discussion, isn't it? But anyway, let's go back to our case study. So, Romana's analysis. Here's the question for you again. So, the stu Romana has found out some important extra feedback from her students. What do you think she decided to do in the future? I like that. Biram Mahan, praise and correction are two sides of the same coin. <laughs> and Dr. Madhavi also likes to use a pencil. Mm. Sangeeta, yeah, really interesting. The students need a stronger or weaker, but always they want the teacher's appreciation, yeah. And I, I remember when I was at school, I always liked that appreciation. It, it motivated me. The same point um, from Praveena. So what do you think Rumana decided to do in the future? Type an answer in the conversation if you can. I don't know if anyone's responding on Facebook, by the way. I, I haven't been watching that because it's usually a little bit later time-wise. I, uh, I, I won't check Facebook. I'll get confused. Yes, Syed, a judicious use of praise and correction. Vinay. Exactly. Yeah, Vinay's got pretty much exactly what she did. <laughs> and yeah, they definitely want to see good. We can never say good to them too much, I don't think. Yes, appreciating the students. Cor yeah, there we go, Sarita, exactly. Correction for the strong and praise for the weak, considering their preferences, yeah. Striking a balance, yeah. Yes, and Venkateshwar has provided some example suggestions the way she can do it, yeah. Great, so let's have a look. How did Rumana's action research end up? This is how her project kind of ended, but noticed it actually became the start of a new cycle of research. She was busy at this time, so she didn't start doing this immediately, but it fed into the rest of her academic year. So based on this action research, this exploratory action research cycle, Rumana decides to balance praise and correction in future, avoiding red pen and avoiding crosses, 
and she decides to use a variety of positive emojis. However, she will increase praise for less confident learners and gently push her stronger learners with a little more correction. I think we all have some of these learners who find that the correction helps them to, to improve, um, you know, and that little bit of pushing helps to motivate them a bit more. But she will also check how things go over the rest of the year. So she's going to keep her eyes and ears open. And remember, that can be data collection. As we're in the classroom on a normal basis, that's part of our data collection. Will students' written work improve? So she can check the scores. And that's quantitative analysis. Maybe if in the midterm exam, their scores are averaging, you can take an average from all the students, and the average score there is maybe 30%. And in the end of term exam, it's maybe 40%. Well, that's an improvement, hopefully, if the exam difficulty is the same. Um, and that's a good sign. Um, and how else can she help the weaker ones? So during the term, she may also try to get feedback from those students who talked about the importance of uh, praise more than correction, because maybe she also wants to ask herself, well, yes, OK, so I can provide praise to the weaker students. But what do I do if a weaker student makes mistakes? Do I correct it? Should I simply just praise them for trying? And this is a question that she still has in mind. She still hasn't answered. And that can be a focus for her next cycle of research. So there we go. You get the idea of what Romana's EAR project, Exploratory Action Research Project, has told her. Lots of chat here. Yes, exactly. So Syed makes this really important point. No two individuals are the same. So Romana has to adopt accordingly. In other words, what we call differentiation, providing feedback based on the students' needs. And this is something that I saw in the participants in my research. Several of them were doing it very interestingly. Um, if you praise the weaker, they will become confident and stronger and they may change over a period, yeah. And it was interesting, one of the classes I observed in Telangana, the girls were doing better than the boys, quite significantly so. And so the teacher was providing this kind of praise to the boys and just pushing the girls a little bit more so that the teacher gave them differentiated feedback of this type that enabled them but all to do a little bit better. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Right. So there we go. There's the example of Rumana's project. Now, what's the implication here for data analysis? Well, all of that stuff about how quantitative and qualitative data is analysed in academic research can be put aside. Yes, you can transcribe interviews, you can write down everything that was said, and you can code them. That will take you hours and hours of work. It may be useful, you may find it useful, but Rumana didn't have to do that. Rumana listened to the interview several times, and that was sufficient for her, especially when she listened with a colleague, to understand what the students were saying and to learn from it, which is the aim of teacher research. So qualitative data. Transcribing and coding can be useful, but they aren't always necessary. They take a lot of time. Listening to an interview carefully and taking notes is a simple but effective way to analyze interview data. And you can team up with a colleague and listen to or watch or read each other's data. Your data could, example, for example, be um, lesson observation videos recorded on a mobile phone. And then you could watch those together with another colleague in the Action Research Project to provide, to give you support for understanding your data. Quantitative data? Well, statistical data, the most important thing to do is simply count it. And I know it sounds obvious, but some teachers often overlook this important point. You can then work out a percentage. So if you've got, say, um, uh, 18 students out of 30 are providing, um, are preferring correction and 12 are preferring um, uh, praise, you can work out what percentage that is of the total. But it tells you very clearly that just over half like one thing and just under half like the other thing. So statistical tests are rarely necessary. To conduct a statistical test on your data, you probably need at least 30 students in each group and you need to separate them out. So if you're interested is in, is there a difference between the girls and the boys in some area, then you'll need at least 60 students to do this. And that's often impractical and involves quite a lot more time and effort to do. So statistical tests, just like data um, transcription and coding, are not something I recommend personally for teacher research. 
graphs. We can all create graphs nice and easily today, but often they don't tell us anything more than the numbers do. I could have presented um, Rumana's data in a graph, but we could see from the information there what the data was telling us. And if you're really interested in looking at it statistically, a little tip is to ask maths teachers. Uh, they love analyzing numerical data. Um, yes, thank you, Vishnu. It's something I thought I found. Vishnu says that girls are ahead of boys. In fact, even research from, even data from the Ministry of Human Resources indicates that girls are outperforming boys across many parts of India today. It's actually a stronger difference in rural areas, that in rural areas, girls are outperforming boys. In urban areas, they're much closer. Sometimes it's even the opposite. Um, and yes, and statistical data can often lead to a why or what question, just as in Rumana's example, even though she, she asked them, which do you prefer correction or do you prefer praise? She still had a puzzle in her head that she had to investigate. And that's why she conducted that extra stage. And this is the important difference that um, teacher research we can add on extra stages to the research. We can go back and collect data. We don't have to plan everything in advance, collect data, analyze, and present. It can be what we call an iterative process, going back to the data source to find out more, to understand more. And this key point that I'd like to make, um, puzzles are good. In teacher research, we are trying to find something we didn't already know. Now think again about Rumana. The first time she interviews the students in the exploratory phase, she does understand basically what they're saying. She understands that the students are saying, yes, we want correction and we want praise. She learns something very important that for one student, the red pen is negative, but she's not sure if that is true for all of the students. So she has this initial puzzle that she can test out in the action phase. And sure enough, for example, she finds out the blue pen is better than the red pen for many students. They prefer her to use it. And she also finds out some important things about which emojis they like and how she can use emojis to stop her feedback looking too negative. Um, so in that sense, as the data collection progressed, Rumana learnt more and more. But she only learned the most important thing when she went back to interview the students after the questionnaire. So the questionnaire told her something useful, but it was only when she interviewed the strongest students and the weakest students separately that the weakest students were confident enough to tell her, actually, ma'am, we prefer praise or I prefer praise. And they gave her reasons. So now she understands why some students need correction and some students need praise and how these can be positive influences on her teaching. So notice that it was only when Rumana had these puzzles, that moment where you're going like this, hmm, I don't understand this, that it helps us as teachers to understand the students. So we go back to the students to collect more data. Nothing wrong with that. And you can do that also with things like lesson observation with other research participants. If you're analyzing materials from a course book or for example, written student data, student writing, you can go back and do more analysis if you need to. And there is no need to stick simply to one design. You don't need to stick to either quantitative or qualitative. Mixed method is always useful because you're using lots of different types of data to find out something. A group of students that you interview may be representative of the whole class, but it's also a good idea to see if their opinions are shared by everyone. So you can go from a qualitative interview to a quantitative questionnaire to check that everyone agrees with what the smaller number of students did. And that's what Rumana did as well. And of course, you can go back to the data source if you need to. The key point to understand here is that in teacher action research, you are in control. If we make it too formal, and this is something to, to mention to mentors as well, if we make it too formal and try to copy what happens in academic research, that isn't necessary because we're not preparing it for publication or qualification, and it is less useful. What is useful for teacher research is that the data collection takes up not too much time, the data analysis takes up not too much time, but it provides us with an understanding, a better understanding of our context, our learners, our teaching, our methods, than we would have if we didn't collect data. Okay, so, and the key question to ask yourself is, if at the end of the process, 
you are confident you have a better understanding, then that means that your analysis was a success. And that key word there is confident. We can never know for certain because somebody mentioned a really important point about subjectivity. There is subjectivity even in quantitative research. I did a recent survey of teachers' beliefs across India, which involved some questions. And one of the important things to note about quantitative research is that it's always dependent on what questions you ask. And the questions that you choose to ask are also a subjective decision. I asked about this, this and this, but I didn't ask about that. And as a result, I may have biased the findings of the research. So it's really important to remember that even quantitative research has that qualitative, has that subjective element. But if you feel confident that you have a better understanding, then as a teacher in your own classroom, that's probably the best understanding that you can get of your learners' needs. Okay, so um, several of you will probably be thinking also about this important question. What if I want to take my research further? Well, you may want to um, share your findings from your research. You can organize a mailer. For example, Elta Telangana could have an action research mailer. You could present at a conference with Eltai or INET or any other in English teacher associations. Or you can arrange an online webinar such as this one. And you can write for a publication. There are some journals now in India, a nice one that's being, I think it's at um, the IFLU University in Hyderabad, EFL University, Fortel is an interesting one that looks quite practical. And uh, Vinay, I know, has recently published in the Indian Journal of Educational Technology, a very interesting article, if you haven't seen it. That's another good one for teachers to publish in. And if you want to take it further, focus on what you learned from the project. That is the most important part of teacher action research. What did I take away from it? And that is often what um, other people attending a talk or reading an article will want to know. Anal analysis may be important if you're taking it further. And that's where you may need to do things like transcription and coding. That's not something I wanted to go into today. It's technical, it's complex, and it's usually not necessary in teacher research. In my own classroom, I rarely do either of those things um, when I'm conducting research with my students. And also consider carefully, do, you find, do your findings apply to other teachers' classrooms? So if you're presenting on your research and you think that you have something that's really useful, let's imagine Rumana is presenting. She can tell other teachers that maybe they should try to experiment with using different colors and with interviewing the stronger and the weaker students separately to see if they have different needs. That could be something she could suggest to other teachers. Not suggesting that I know what is best for your learners because maybe a different teacher's learners won't care about the color of the pen. But what is interesting is she can make suggestions and teachers can take them away. And then of course, if you're writing, the most important thing to do is to read example articles from the journal. And it can sometimes be difficult to get those. If you need uh, an example article from an academic journal, ask someone who's studying at a university to get them. Like me, uh, feel free to drop me an email. Um, and we can usually get hold of these articles for free through our academic access. And also another suggestion, if you have a mentor for your action research, they may be interested in co-writing with you. So the two of you can work together. And that usually makes a piece of writing much better, even though it takes a lot more time when there's two opinions. Okay, so let me show you some interesting publications which are of use here. I'm just coming to the end of the talk now. I've run over a little bit, but hopefully we'll have time to hang around and have, ask some questions. One beautiful publication is called Teachers Voices Capturing the Dynamics of Change. This is research that was conducted in Bangladesh, an action research project. But in there, there is some really nice examples of teachers presenting very simply and clearly on their own action research projects. Not only can you learn from what's happening in Bangladesh and having worked myself in both countries, I can confirm that there is a lot of similarities from the shared heritage of Bangladesh and India. They both inherited uh, education systems from the, from the, the British, unfortunately, um, the um, British uh, invasion, if I can use that term of these countries with their education systems. And, as a result, both countries do have a lot in common in terms of the background, such as the focus on language and literature is important in both, which isn't common around the world, um, and also some of the challenges. So this, this book, if you want to download it, again, you can get it from my slides, and I'll show you the link at the end, is a really useful one. 
Um, some other books that those of you who are interested in exploratory action research, here is the key one. It's called A Handbook for Exploratory Action Research, written by Richard Smith and Paula Ribolledo. Um, and those two authors make very, very clear the process of exploratory action research. And there they do go into detail about different ways that you can uh, transcribe and code data, different ways you can, you, you can conduct statistical analysis. But even there, they don't get into too much detail because it often isn't necessary for teacher research. Um, and then finally, some more stories. These ones are from Chile in South America, and they're called Champion Teachers, Stories of Exploratory Action Research. And all of these teachers use the exploratory action research approach to investigate their own classrooms. And you can see some photos of them presenting posters and having conversations about this at conferences. There we go. Great. So I think I've finished. Um, now, would we like to, I don't know how much time we have um, left, if anybody wants to come on and tell me if we've got some time, but now it's really interesting to start thinking about your questions and your contributions. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and make a comment, uh, a suggestion, a critical comment as well, I welcome those. I'm very interested in those because I will learn from critique as well. Um, please do, please add your thoughts and ideas. Thank you, Padma. Yes, yeah, similar rural backgrounds in India and Bangladesh as well. Uh, giving a lot of inputs about the data analysis. So one question is that, so generally during our classroom-based action research, we collect the data at two points. One is during an exploration stage. So the second one is whatever that we practice or implement in the activity phase. So what do you think which one is more important and why? So which data is whether good one, whether it is qualitative or a quantitative? Yeah, thank you, Vinay. If you're interview, if if you're collecting data from students, I would. Uh, my personal feeling is. Um, Excuse me. And my personal feeling is that I've always learned more by collecting qualitative data from students. And I would I learn more from doing what Rumana did, which is small focus groups. Anna Maria Pinter, my second supervisor, is also an expert on interviewing and working with younger learners. And one of the things that she recommends, and Harry Kucher in one piece they write, recommend, is to work with friendship groups of students. So if you want to do student interviews and you want them to be free and open, interview students in groups of friends. You know, they sit together in the classroom. They talk together sometimes in our lessons. Well, if we interview them together, they will often share and be much more relaxed by each other's presence. And if the students are relaxed, they're more honest with us. And that is, in a way, the first stage of analysis, getting the right kind of data that gives us insights into the students, their needs, their lives, their interests. So I personally would definitely say that interviews work better. But if you combine interviews with a questionnaire, you can check that what the students in the focus group said is true about everyone. So based on the interview, you can create a questionnaire to check if the answers you got there are true for everyone. And also one thing that might be useful to suggest is when you do a questionnaire, always leave space for open answers. Students can write their answer in any language they want to, as long as you can read it as the teacher. And so you can get more information in that, at that point um, on your um, area of interest, your research question. Any, any more questions from the participants? Please, you can use chat box or you can unmute yourself and you can ask. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good, good evening, Jason, sir. Yes, Vishnu, sir. How are you? Yeah, fine, sir. So I'm, I'm presently working at a non-English medium high school. So I, yeah, I also shared a questionnaire with uh, neighboring school high English teachers. And a combination of uh, close-ended and open-ended questions. And most of the teachers uh, opined uh, that so lack of uh, language exposure, the students may not be able to improve their speaking skills. And uh, 
I would like to ask you, so in what way, in what way is this qualitative analysis helpful to teachers to improve the speaking skills of students mm -hmm. uh, who are with uh, non-English medium background? Thank you, Vishnu. This is such an important question and such a common question across India. But I want to just um, make another important point that this isn't just common across India. It's common across all 30 something countries I've worked in in my life, except where English is spoken as a first language, in other words, in the UK or the USA. And even in the UK and the USA, some students have difficulty speaking in English because they come from a different first language background. So it's a universal, I wouldn't even say a problem, it's a natural part of language learning. That students, of course, Vishnu, you make a really important point, they need exposure. And as some of your research, I know Vinay has shared some of your research and your colleagues' research has shown, one of the interesting things is that students don't always get any exposure to English outside the school. So sometimes providing them with exposure to English, and I'm going to use an example from Vinay's class, if I may. Vinay used the um, Telangana state. You know that there's, as well as the textbooks, there's also the audiovisual resources, where there are people reading stories, where there are people um, using the textbook materials. And you can play those on a computer using a projector. And, student, and even in Vinay's rural school, this was possible. And students can listen, and they can listen to what is, for me, the perfect English accent for a child in Telangana, and that is your accent, your accent, Vishnu, Vinay's accent, the accent of people from Telangana, because your accents provide the best model for the students. You will be much easier for them to understand because you have the same uh, phonetic basis to your accent, the same way that the sounds are pronounced, than my accent. Students in Telangana may one day need to understand a British English native speaker like me, but first and foremost, they need to learn and understand the beautiful variety of Indian Englishes that we have. So the first type of exposure you can provide is providing ac access to students to listen to stories, to listen to uh, text being read out and on the audiovisual material that you have in Telangana and in other states. But also remembering that learning to speak is a long, difficult process. And I know because I've learned to speak many languages. When I was learning Hindi for my research, it took me two years of intense study before I could even string a sentence together in Hindi. And I've learned many languages in my past, I know how to do it. So we need lots and lots and lots of practice. The students need opportunities to practice reading out sentences, that's useful for them. They need practice to create sentences. They can write them down and they can present what they've written. One thing again, if I may use Vinay's example, is he gets students to present on their work. And that presentation gives the students some confidence that they, yes, I can speak in English. Yes, my teacher, my classmates understand my English and they gradually gain confidence as you go through the different grades. So to, I know you were making a comment and your comment is absolutely true, Vishnu, but the key points I think that you make, I would agree with, that they do need exposure, but let's expose them to English pronounced in Telugu accents because that helps them to understand the English first and then they can move to other international accents as well. And let us also give them lots of opportunities for speaking, sometimes structured, but also free speaking. When students get to that point where they can discuss in a conversation of languages, even if they want to mix Telugu and English, this is what we call translanguaging, and we don't think it's a bad thing anymore, and that mixture will often help them to build their English slowly. Thank you very much for your detailed explanation, Jason, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. One more last question. Then, uh, sir, Sampath, sir, will tell them sometimes, and we'll conclude the session. Please. Uh, good evening, sir. Hi, Padma. How are you? Uh, fine, Jason, sir. And your explanation is very good and it's very clear. Uh, if I am not, uh, my question is not silly, but I uh, just no I want to clear question. this. Uh, quantitative data usually appears to be clear, visible, and authentic. For other action researchers, like we, we are beginners. So numerical data gives us clear uh, picture of the 
data collection. We often get confused with qualitative data because since there is a chance of inclusion of the beliefs and assumptions of action researchers. So doesn't qualitative data appears to be subjective and manipulative? Uh, yes, it does. And it's a, it's a really important point. And the point you make about quantitative data is true as well. It is clear. But quantitative data can also be manipulative and subjective. I gave you an example, and I want to just provide more detail on that example because everyone here will understand. I was interviewing, I was, I was um, using a questionnaire to survey Indian teachers' beliefs about the effective classroom, the effective teaching. And one piece of feedback I got from the great Dr. Amol Padwad, fascinating piece of feedback. He said, I'm very surprised that they don't talk much about the use of the mother tongue in the classroom. And I said, oh, yes, they don't. And I suddenly realized that in this more objective, quantitative survey, I'd forgotten to ask them a question about it. And that oversight, the fact that I forgot, was essentially a product of the fact that I was biased. And it's a good example of how quantitative data can also be subjective and manipulative. If when you're asking questions to students, you don't ask them about a specific thing, that's also subjective, that's also manipulative. And whilst in my research, it wasn't too big a problem because it wasn't really focused to um, focus on different language use, um, it was an omission. And it's an example of how um, quantitative data can also be manipulative. Um, think about how we go about daily life. If we want to find out something, what's useful to us often is the qualitative data. If we want to find out about how to cook a dish at the market, which vegetables are better quality, you could go around surveying everyone, or you could just get the opinion of a really great chef. I know which one I would trust to, to, to know where to buy the right food. And the same is true about our learners. Qualitative um, information provides us with a much richer source of data on which to make decisions as teachers. And if you think about Rumana's example, she did get the quantitative data that was that you're talking about, but she didn't really understand why there seemed to be a balance between students who wanted correction and students who wanted positive feedback praise until she conducted the second set of interviews and noticed an important difference. Now, you could probably find that difference a different way if you're a really experienced quantitative researcher. You could conduct, also conduct a, a test on students' proficiency, and then you would see the same relationship. But the key point here is that Rumana managed to find that out by combining the quantitative and the qualitative. So maybe, Padma, we can agree that the best way to do research in this sense is to combine the objectivity that we can get from quantitative research and the subjectivity, the opinions that we get from qualitative research by using a mixed methods approach. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. If we have time, of course, and I, I Padma Ma'am, in your research, you may be busy, you may only have time to do the quantitative, if so, great. But for me personally, I've always found it really, really useful to do a combination. And most of my research involves such combinations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Padma, for your interesting observation. And thank you, Mamata, for sharing the slides again. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Laxman. Hello, Jason. How are, you? How are you? I'm fine. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I'm fine, sir. So uh, I agree with that, your statement that even quantitative data is also manipulative and subjective. Uh, and even uh, that is possible with qualitative data. But uh, whereas uh, in our uh, rural area, most of the students are unable to uh, write answers for the open-ended questions. So most of our teachers are tend to give uh, what those ended uh, uh, questionnaire to them so that they can easily answer and uh, uh, we can collect the data from from the students. And we also, uh, most of our teacher uh, uh, researchers collecting data in the form of interviews. 
so here the problem the most of our feature train uh, researchers find it to triangulate the data and uh, uh, between quantitative and qualitative can you give any some suggestions to triangulate the data and can you uh, give any uh, can you suggest any resources where we can learn uh, the some triangulation tips yeah, it's really good points. First and foremost, Lakshman, I completely agree that it's often difficult for students to give qualitative data. And often what happens when we try to interview them, they often don't say as much as we would hope. And as you say, Lakshman, writing detailed responses can be difficult. So the first suggestion I would make there, at primary level, it definitely is going to be difficult for them to provide those detailed written responses because they're still developing their literacy. But by secondary level, they usually have good literacy in languages such as Telugu. If they're studying in Hyderabad, for example, they may also have literacy in uh, Hindi. Um, and we can also ask them to provide data in feedback in any of those languages and also through the interview data. To conduct an interview doesn't necessarily take too long. And if you get the students talking, if you can relax them, you can sometimes collect more data in 10 or 15 minutes from a small group of learners than you can by giving the same questionnaire to a whole class. And I want to use Romana's example again to make that point, that she did do a, a questionnaire with 30 students, but she learned more from the interviews. Now, the second part of your question was, um, how do we combine them? And I would say, use your common sense. If you, there is something you don't understand in the answers to your questionnaire, work out how can I, what question can I ask them to understand it? So if one of your questions, the responses is not clear, or you don't understand why they put the same, it could be that your question was misunderstood. And that's another reason how uh, quantitative data can be misleading or can be inaccurate, can provide inaccurate findings. Um, it could be that there is something that you're not thinking about as a teacher, not you personally, but our example teacher, such as Romana, wasn't thinking about the fact that the stronger students wanted something very different to what the weaker students in her class wanted. And so the quantitative data can often lead us to a why question or a what question or a how question. So after conducting your survey, you can then Follow it up with interviews that help you to understand the bits of the survey that were puzzling. Remember that idea of puzzling. So you, that would be what we would call a quan-qual design. So you start with a quantitative survey followed by qualitative interviews. You can also do the opposite. You can start with qualitative interviews, which many teachers do in the exploratory phase, followed by a quantitative survey. And in that situation, you're using the interviews to come up with ideas for questions for your questionnaire. And then you can use the questions generated in the qualitative interview on the questionnaire to see if all the students agree with the students who you interviewed in the interview, if that makes sense. Thank you, Jason. Uh, really, it's so, uh, wonderful. And uh, you mentioned one point that a researcher should use his common sense. So yeah, that is a absolutely. very uh, good takeaway from your uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm sure you do. I'm sure all teachers here use that common sense. That common sense is yeah. the most important tool we have. Oh. Remember that we are always collecting data every day of our lives as teachers. You know, when you ask a question and you look at faces and you can tell if they've understood the question or not, that's data collection. Formative feedback is data, and that data helps us to make decisions on a daily basis. All that teacher research does is it makes it a little bit more carefully collected, a little bit more carefully analyzed, and that provides us with the understanding that we need to improve as teachers. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm Sampath here. Hi, Sampath, sir. How yeah, are you? yeah, yeah, fine, thank you. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, this is the uh, role of a teacher researcher uh, to find whether we are uh, reaching our uh, uh, means uh, target group uh, to collect the data and analyze it, and the caring and uh, means uh, uh, taking uh, meticulously and analyzing it in a, uh, with the common sense and the, in a proper way. So in a qualitative way, it's a, a great learning from your session, sir, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sampath. 
so uh, is it thank you uh, to... thank you jason thank you very much for providing uh, a lot of information uh, we really indebted to you for uh, providing uh, various uh, not uh, uh, for answering various questions that are posed by our uh, teacher researchers really our teachers are uh, very new to this type of project and uh, so that uh, they have they are facing some problems but uh, the data that you have provided the analysis that you have given about uh, collecting uh, quantitative both quantitative and qualitative data and analyzing it uh, with an example is very useful to us i hope uh, our teachers uh, would uh, make use of uh, the information that you have provided and uh, definitely uh, would go with new spirits that you have provided thank you thank you very much Thank you, Venkateshwar, and thank you also for your, your comment as well. That was very kind. Thank you. Thank you also, Aruna. Also, That's Vinay great. And Mamta, any others? Uh, please, from participants' side, anything to ask? And please. Um, ju just, Padma asks another really interesting question that I could address. She asks, can we use the same questions for both qualitative and quantitative? Um, one of you guys mentioned in your research this difference between open-ended and closed-ended questions. That's exactly the same in the classroom. When we ask a closed question, it's a short question, and we can use it to check certain things. But the amount of feedback we get from a closed question is limited. And closed questions can be easier on questionnaires. So, for example, if you ask a question that has a yes or no answer, that's closed, and that is often an easy one for students to respond to. But you can also use open questions, open-ended questions on the questionnaire, providing you allow learners to respond in whatever language is most comfortable, and you allow the time for them to do so. Um, then the same questions you can use in an interview, you can often use on a questionnaire, but you'll always get slightly shorter answers in the questionnaire uh, than you will in an interview, as long as the students are comfortable in the interview. Vinay? Thank you, Sampa, and thank you for all the teachers for joining the session. Really, it's a great experience for us. And I also request all the teacher researchers and mentors, instead of understanding the story of instances to whatever the teacher researcher story, apply those principles to your own, your whatever that you are doing that. So that will help this session become more successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for having thank, me. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you, very you. much. Thank you very much, uh, Jason, thank sir, you, and thank uh, you, our sir. providers, our uh, leaders also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Faravina. Thank you, sir. Thank you for thank you all. staying well, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah. And look after your families and remember to practice hygiene and wearing masks. Yes, We've sir. got to beat this virus, haven't we? Yeah.